Welcome to Community Connection. I'm your host, Martha Constantinides. Our guest today is State Senator John Keenan. Senator Keenan serves the towns of Braintree, Quincy, Holbrook, Abington, Rockland, and Hanover. Senator Keenan has been serving for 13 years in the State Senate. Senator, thank you for joining Good. us today. Thank you, Martha. It's great to be here. So I'll get into, right, into the questions right away. So for some of us who do not know politics very well, can you give us a little bit of your background, where you went to school, why you decided to be, um, why, you just, why you decided to get into public service, and just some of that? Sure. So background-wise, I grew up in Quincy. I went to the Quincy Public Schools. I was a fourth of seven children. Um, sometimes I like to say the forgotten child, which wasn't <laughs> a bad thing. Uh, so I grew up in Quincy, Quincy Public Schools, and then I was, uh, went to Harvard University, did my undergraduate mm -hmm. there, um, and worked a lot of hours in the athletic department, which was, which was great, as did um, our new governor, Mara Healy. Yep. Um, she worked in the athletic department as well, and played basketball. Um, I didn't play. <laughs> and then uh, from college, I went on to law school, Suffolk University, graduated from law school, did some work um, as a litigator and a public defender, did that for several years, mm -hmm. and then just always had the urge to kind of work in government, and I went to work as the chief of staff to Mayor Jim Sheets in Quincy, did that for almost four years, and then ran the Norfolk County Public Pension System and served on the Quincy City Council at the same time for nine years, and then ran for the State Senate in 2010, gets sworn in 2011, and um, here I am. Awesome. So what are your, some of your day-to-day -day operations in the Senate? It, it really varies. It uh, depends on what time of year it is and what day of the week it is. So when we are in session, um, formal sessions, that's when we are there to vote on roll call votes on matters of uh, importance or bigger items. Um, it may be uh, having a caucus first among Democrats to talk about bills that are coming before the Senate mm -hmm. that day or bills that may be coming before the Senate uh, the following week or two weeks later. And then we're in session, and it's been a little bit different because of COVID. There's been a lot of remote participation, but um, I've been there in the session in the chamber. So we're there voting and reviewing legislation and filing amendments, debating amendments. And then after that, um, you may have to, you know, once session's over, scoot uh, to Quincy or Braintree for some sort of an event, mm -hmm. whether it's a, a town meeting or a council meeting. Uh, so it's, it's, it, that's a type of day. Another type of day, like today, it was uh, a day for office hours. So it was in Quincy for office hours and Holbrook for office hours. Stopped by the Rockland Public Library for an event there. Uh, I'm here now. Um, so it's a day that there was a, quite a bit of running around in the district, which is great because you get a lot of feedback. Yeah, so going back, you mentioned bills a little bit. Can you go into, I mean, there's thousands of bills that are filed every year, but few usually come into law. Can you just explain the process of how a bill becomes a law? I wish I knew. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, so there's, there's about 7,000 bills. You, you mentioned thousands of bills. There's nearly 7,000 bills that have been filed this legislation legislative session. So once we are elected, we start the process of drafting those bills. Mm -hmm. Then we're sworn in and we have a, about a week and a half or so to get those bills filed uh, by bill filing deadline. Once the bills are filed, then uh, there's the process of forming committees. Those committees are formed and we just did that. The chairs and vice chairs of the committees are put in place. And when that work is done, then all the bills are assigned to a committee, to the committee that has subject matter jurisdiction over. And once the bills are in committee, the committee chairs, members of the committee uh, familiarize themselves with the bills. And then each bill, each of the 7,000 bills has a public hearing. And so a lot of our time is spent having a public hearing on all the bills. And in addition to the oral testimony that we receive, people will send us written materials. And then also advocates will schedule meetings with us uh, to talk about the legislation, those who are in favor of different bills are opposed. And then ultimately the committee has to make a decision of whether to advance the bill or to have it stay in committee for what they call uh, further study, which essentially means it dies for that legislative session. Okay. If the bill comes out of committee with a favorable report, it might go to the Ways and Means Committee if it's a Senate bill, or the House Ways and Means if it's a House bill. And then there's further review done and then it may make its way to the Senate floor. Amendments are offered on the Senate floor. There's a debate. If the Senate passes a version of the bill and the House, with their process, passes a version of the bill that's different, 
Then there's a conference committee that's formed to iron out those differences. Mm -hmm. A vote is then taken on their final bill and off it goes to the governor. It can happen, uh, bills can move in a matter of days or weeks and mm -hmm. sometimes it takes multiple attempts to get a bill passed. Okay, so how many committees are there? There are, I looked that up, I wasn't certain actually, so there are 33 joint committees. Okay. So it covers a broad range of topics and joint committees are committees where there is a Senate chair and a House chair, Senate vice chair, House vice chair, and usually there are 11 members of the House and seven members of the, uh, six members, I'm sorry, of the Senate on the committee. Some of them uh, have 13 members of the House and eight members of, um, seven members of the Senate. So there are 33 joint committees mm -hmm. covering everything from transportation to uh, public health to healthcare, finance, it's, uh, telecommunications, utilities, just a broad range of topics. And then both the House and the Senate have 11 committees that are unique to the Senate and unique to the House. And those have to do more with how bills are processed through the different bodies. Uh, bills in third reading is one of the committees. Mm -hmm. The Rules Committee is one. Um, so there are many, many committees, and some of them end up with a lot of bills. Some of them end up with a lesser number of bills, but um, all the committees are pretty active. Okay, so you had mentioned that when the bills go through some of the committees, they can die during the sessions. So when bills get lost in, in the committee, how does that happen? Um, they don't, it's, they generally don't get lost in the committee. At some point, we have a, uh, a deadline by which action has to be taken on the bill. So you either have to say, you know, it's not going to go any further, it needs further study, so it's going to basically stay in committee and that's the end of it, or it'll be reported out favorably. Um, sometimes it'll be discharged to a different committee. Um, and for instance, when I was doing the housing committee last session, we had a couple of bills that we discharged over to the revenue committee, mm -hmm. which actually um, in the House, Representative Cusack chairs that committee. Um, so we discharged it from the Senate with a recommendation to, uh, from the housing committee with a recommendation to the revenue committee as to what our thoughts were, but recognizing that it would fall under their jurisdiction and it had to do with uh, transfer fees mm -hmm. on sale of real estate. So sometimes they just shipped off to a different, uh, a different committee. Mm -hmm. Um, where they kind of get lost in the process is at the end of the legislative session, we operate on a two-year legislative session, the last couple weeks, last couple days, the last day can be very hectic and sometimes mm -hmm. bills that pass the House and pass the Senate and look like they're ready to move forward, they just, uh, there's just not enough time. Okay. And so they end up just, uh, just kind of uh, dying at that point, a day short of the end of the legislative session or this past um, July 31st, our end of year legislative session went 23 straight hours. And so there were some bills that maybe if there was four more hours, they might have passed, but- um, It's a long day. <laughs> it's a long day and, and it's not a good way to do government. So even yeah. though we say, oh, if four more hours, it might have passed, it should have been addressed. The, many of the bills should have been addressed the week before or the month before. Yeah. But people work the deadlines often. Okay, so what committees do you serve on? So this uh, legislative session, I will be the Senate Chair of the Joint Committee on Election Laws, mm -hmm. and, uh, and I will continue my work on the Housing Committee this session as the Vice Chair of the Housing Committee, Senate Vice Chair. I also serve on the Senate, Senate and Joint Committee on Ways and Means, the um, Healthcare Finance Committee, and also the Mental Health and Substance Use Committee, which is one that I've been on for quite some time. I was former chair of that. Mm -hmm. And then there's a couple other committees, but those are the uh, Transportation Committee, which is actually one that's very relevant in the district that I represent because there's so much of a transportation network between roads and bridges and uh, commuter rails, red line, bus networks. So um, that's an important committee as well. Okay, so of the bills that you filed so far, I believe there's around 47. Is there a common theme among them? Well, I, I think so. Um, I really haven't thought of it in that way. Um, a lot of the bills I file tend to be people-focused bills as opposed to industry-focused. So, for instance, in substance use and mental health area, we file a lot of bills. Um, mm -hmm. We have a bill that would mandate insurance coverage for up to 30 days of treatment uh, in, in recovery in substance cases. We have legislation that would make sure that people who are receiving mental health treatment also have access to uh, substance use treatment and vice versa, even in the same facility. Mm -hmm. We have introduced legislation 
to uh, require insurance companies to cover alternatives to opioids. So if somebody's in pain, rather than default to prescribing them an opioid prescription, of, um, an opioid medication, that there be alternatives available to them as well. So that's kind of what we do on the substance side and a whole lot of other things there. And then on the mental health side, it's about making access to mental health treatment equal to what it would be for physical uh, health. And then we do some work in the field of disabilities, for people with disabilities, making sure that they have access to uh, proper uh, programming. So I think that's probably the theme is it's more people focused yeah. as opposed to industry. Okay. Um, I know you mentioned some pretty important topics right there. Are there any that are very important to you specifically? or? Um, the mental health and substance use area has been one <clears throat> that I've been involved with since my first year in the legislature, and it's something that I have continued to focus on. Um, it's, you know, it, it gets personal, and, um, so, and it's real. I mean, it's just you can do things in that committee and have an impact on people's lives. Mm -hmm. And even if it's just going out, I found over the years, and sitting at somebody's kitchen table, somebody who's in recovery, or somebody that lost somebody to an overdose, uh, it's just very real and it's very compelling, and uh, I really, I, I, I like that. It's terrible to say, like I like doing work in that field, but it, I find it uh, is, is rewarding and it can impact people's lives. And when I first was doing it, my wife used to tell me when I get home, you know, you have to leave it at the door. Um, you just can't let it consume you, but it's, it's really interesting work and um, helping people is why we kind of do this work. Yeah. And then in the district, there, the issues that come up that are really important is transportation, as I mentioned, because we're a transportation um, a district with a lot of transportation. And housing increasingly has been something that I think needs uh, more focus than it's had, and it, that's starting to build the momentum to do different things in housing. Mm -hmm. And this session, as we enter the next election cycle leading up to the next presidential election, election laws are going to be very important. Mm -hmm. We're pretty lucky in Massachusetts that we have good laws in place but um, they're constantly being challenged. And so being chair of the election laws committee is going to be really interesting over the next couple of years. Yeah, okay, so I'm gonna switch gears a little bit. Um, you mentioned earlier Governor Maura Healey. Um, so, and we obviously have a somewhat new Boston mayor, Michelle Wu. Um, so could you just give us your impression of the, the, the work that they've done so far? I think both of them have worked really hard and they've come in with some new ideas. Um, Mayor Wu has been there for a year, so we have a little better sense of um, what she's done and where she's going. And she's clearly focusing on education, and she's in the middle of some tough issues uh, in Boston relative to whether to have an appointed or an elected school mm -hmm. committee. There's a lot of discussion now about some of her housing proposals, rent control of rent stabilization, and her redesign of the Boston uh, Development uh, mm -hmm. Agency, um, BP. I can't remember what they call it, but she wants to restructure that. Mm -hmm. um, so that she's making progress on those. And in the governor's situation, she's there you know, just now for a little over a month. And uh, she's hit the ground running. She has experience as attorney general, so she knows a lot of the people who are um, engaged at the state level. And I think she's going to be, and is showing to be very practical, very methodical, and open to suggestions and ideas and willing to work with people. And for those who, who liked Governor Baker because he was like that, I think they're going to get more of the same with Mara Healy in terms of how she approaches the job. They may have different policy positions, mm -hmm. but I think how they approach the job is, is gonna be very similar. Um, I always said Governor Baker woke up every morning with the idea that he wanted to do good things mm -hmm. and went to work, worked hard, was honest and was willing to work with people. And Mara Healy, I know will be the same way because that's how she was as Attorney General. And so, what more can you ask? No, You can absolutely. disagree on policy, but you know, what more can you really ask? Yeah, no, that's very important. So, can you just tell me, in your opinion, what challenges you think that they might face with the legislator? Um, I think it's, it'll be a little less so than maybe in the past. For instance, when Governor Patrick went to the legislature, I wasn't there at the time, but I heard you know, it was a bit of an adjustment for both the legislature and for him because he was new to government. Mm -hmm. Mari Healy has some pretty well-established relationships with legislators, and so I don't think it'll be a big adjustment. It will be a question of legislators and her team getting to know each other, mm -hmm. and that's occurring now uh, as the new secretaries are appointed. She seems to be putting some really good people in place, and so there's that period of getting to know each other. 
Um, but uh, I think you know, once that kind of occurs and people start working to the same goal, I, I think we'll, we'll get some things done. Yeah, it'll all come together. Yes. Okay, so I have a couple of issues that I'd like to list off to you. Um, I mean, some of them are important to the state, and I, I just kind of want to know what strategies does a state legislator and the Senate in particular um, have to address them. So um, I have, there's opioids and mental health, gun violence in our cities, food insecurities among the state's poor, transportation, specifically leadership of the MBTA, um, and then COVID, of course, is still hanging around us. So. A lot. Yeah, there's quite a few <laughs> yeah, there. Quite a few. So, um, so in terms of opioids, we were prior to the pandemic making pretty good progress. Um, we had seen as OxyContin was introduced, we saw the number of prescriptions of OxyContin rise, and at the same time, the number of prescriptions was rising. We saw the number of overdose deaths increase as well. Just before the uh, pandemic we were bending that curve. We were starting to see the programs that we put in place show results. And we saw that overdose, overdose death rate level off and start to turn down. And a number of overdoses, the same thing. And then COVID hit. And that connection between uh, people who were seeking recovery assistance and the programs that we had put in place, that connection was broken because of COVID. People couldn't get to treatment programs they couldn't get to their support programs and as a result we we saw things get worse and as covid hit just before that and then throughout covid fentanyl hit the streets mm -hmm. and fentanyl is a very powerful opioid about 10 times more powerful than heroin and so the combination of people's access to programming being cut off because of the pandemic and the introduction of introduction of fentanyl it was just a, a really bad situation we're starting to get back on track, mm -hmm. but we have a lot of ground to make up. And now, as we're starting to get a better understanding of fentanyl, there are new drugs coming in. Um, I had introduced legislation for the Methamphetamine Commission mm -hmm. to study methamphetamine, which had created problems throughout the country, but had kind of, uh, it didn't really surface here in Massachusetts. Mm -hmm. But it is, and um, so we're getting, trying to get ready for that. And now there's a, a new drug out there, a synthetic drug that's used by veterinarians, um, and it's being mixed in with the fentanyl supply, and people um, take what they believe to be fentanyl and end up beyond their reaction to the fentanyl, basically just passing out for extended periods of time. Um, the respiration's not quite an overdose, um, really a diminished, and they wake up not knowing where they had been. It also causes pretty severe rashes that lead to infections. So just terrible, terrible drug and drugs that are out there on the streets. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that we're trying in the opioid field is to do harm reduction, uh, test strips. So, so, you, so somebody has some sense of what drugs are out there. People who use drugs recreationally, cocaine, are now finding it mixed with fentanyl and think they're using cocaine and they're overdosing on fentanyl. So we're looking at harm reduction methods so that we can reduce the harms associated with drug use, mm -hmm. HIV, um, endocarditis, which is a heart condition that comes from regular intravenous drug use, which, um, hepatitis. So ways to kind of reduce those consequences of drug use. Mm -hmm. And if we're successful with that, then we also reduce visits to the emergency departments and the costs associated with that. Okay. So there's a quite a bit going on in the opioid field. Okay. Um, gun violence, um, it seems like every time you turn on the TV, there's something else happening. And we just had the tragic case of the 13-year-old boy from Norwood who was shot and killed in Mattapan. Um, you know, you turn on the TV, and I was sitting with my mother the other day, and we were watching TV, and she says, oh, just, it's just all out of control. The numbers are different than the perception. Mm -hmm. In Boston, um, you know, there are a, um, fewer shootings trending, uh, but there tend to be um, more fatal shootings. And there are more arrest of juveniles with guns than in the past. But overall, the, the crime trend is better than over a five-year period. It, it shows a, a bit of a decline overall. Um, but there are some really problem areas, and other cities are facing more difficulties than Boston. But um, you know, in terms of gun violence, it's, uh, it's really, uh, the answer to me, from my perspective, is mm -hmm. 
giving young people hope, and that means getting them as good of an education as possible, making sure that they have decent housing, that you know, when they, if they get folks through high school, that they have job opportunities or opportunities for higher education. All those things ultimately lead to less gun violence, mm -hmm. and um, we're not doing as well as we should yeah. in some of those areas. So. In terms of the, the cities and towns that you represent, is there any concerns on gun violence in those towns? Um, nothing directly. We do see incidents. We've seen okay. some very tragic incidents here in, um, in Braintree, yep. uh, clearly. And we've seen um, not necessarily gun violence, but other domestic violence incidents uh, throughout the South Shore and all across the Commonwealth. Mm -hmm. um, they gain, you know, they're, they're just kind of horrific events that gain a lot of attention, um, but you know, we just have to work harder on, on all those things. And domestic violence is one where we try really hard and it's, um, we have to be able to connect people to services and to supports before it gets to the point where somebody's harming somebody else. Mm -hmm. But gun violence, you know, is, is something that we'll get another look this term in the legislature. There's discussions about addressing the issue of ghost guns and some of these 3D printed guns mm -hmm. that you, you can basically make your own weapons now. So or have those been more common? Recently? They are much more common. They're showing up okay. more at crime scenes and it's very difficult for law enforcement to trace them and to find out you know, who may be responsible for crime because they, they lack that ability to kind of trace a weapon. Um, so I think we'll see some action or activity on, on that in the legislature. And then you know, when you talk about ways to reduce gun violence, keeping young people in school, it kind of goes into one of the other topics you mentioned about food and security. Yeah. Um, during COVID, uh, free school lunches were extended to uh, to every student, mm -hmm. and um, there's legislation that I've co-sponsored that would make that program permanent. And people say, well, how expensive is it? Some school districts have found that the cost of determining who's eligible for a free lunch is sometimes greater than the cost of actually just providing the lunch. And the administrative uh, burden of de making that determination takes up a, a lot of work hours. Mm -hmm. And so some schools within districts and some districts have just decided, you know, we'll just make it available. If, if students want lunch, they can have lunch. Mm -hmm. And so um, Senator DiDomenico from Everett has filed legislation I've co-sponsored to, to make that program available statewide. Awesome, that's great. Um, so is there anything in transportation and the, the specifically leadership of the MBTA that you have any concerns about? I do. <laughs> <laughs> um, when I couldn't believe it yesterday, when, and it's happened the day before, when an Orange Line train on Route 495 is causing a traffic jam, I, you know, it, it's, it's almost, how can this happen? You it's, can expect it when you're actually on the train, but not, yes. you know, when you're on the road. Yeah, so. it's, it's almost <laughs> surreal, and it really does indicate a number of problems that we have with the MBTA and the, the number of things that we have to do. Um, I take the red line pretty regularly, and I will tell you that over the last several months, it's gotten worse. Um, the weights for trains, what they call the headways, are much, much greater. And then the trains are much slower going through slow zones uh, on the red line to get to downtown Boston. So I could generally rely on, a plan on getting from my house to the state house in about 40 minutes by using the red line. Getting to the station, getting on the train, and then walking up to, to the state house. I have to plan on probably another 20 minutes to make that same trip on the way in. And Sometimes I'll look at my app, I have an app that tells me when the train's coming, mm -hmm. and I also have Google Maps, and you do the comparison, and sometimes I guess I'll just drive in, yeah. um, although I prefer the train. And um, so we've got to make sure that we work through those issues of slow zones. That means doing some compression work on the tracks, uh, stabilizing some of the tracks, putting new rails in, new um, uh, supports for them. Um, it means we have to continue our updating of our signalizations. Mm -hmm. We've made some progress there. We have to keep doing that. It means making sure that we get those trains from the Springfield facility to the red line and the orange line, and that has just been a mess. Mm -hmm. um, just by comparison, I went up to Montreal to look at their new train um, that the system that they built. The main system is underground, yeah. but they built 67 kilometers of new rail outdoors and they built the rail, procured the cars, mm -hmm. built the maintenance facilities, the assembly facilities, built the stations, the parking lots in five years. Oh. By the time we get our new orange and red line cars, it might be a total of 10 years just to get the cars. 
And so it kind of highlights to me what a, uh, a bit of a mess it's been. And then safety is a major concern. We've had some really terrible incidents on the red line, including somebody dying, a really terrible death. And so safety has to be a major concern. The federal government is now involved in that uh, oversight. So we have to decide who will we put in charge of day-to-day -day oversight of the MBTA's safety programming. Mm -hmm. It's right now the Department of Public Utilities. They've got a lot of other things they do and they do better. They shouldn't be doing it for um, sub, uh, bus and subway transportation. Mm -hmm. I don't think. It should be an independent group that oversees the safety commission. And then we have to change the culture of safety. If somebody who works with a T in a garage sees a safety problem, mm -hmm. in the past couple of years they've been encouraged to call an anonymous safety tip line. And that they have to do that suggests there's something wrong with the culture. I would think that if a mechanic came across something that was a safety concern to that mechanic, the mechanic should say, time out, raise the hand. Some sort of a supervisor or a team should come over and look at it. And instead of saying, you know, why'd you, why'd you raise your hand? It should be, good job. Yeah. Thanks for bringing that to our attention. Let's get on it. Let's fix it, rather than have an anonymous tip line. And then, of course, we need a, a new general manager and um, to oversee all of this. And it's, it's a really big, difficult task. Yeah. So choosing the right general manager is going to be very important, and it's going to be a real test of the governor's uh, leadership. Yeah, absolutely. So you seem like you're, I mean, I know you're part of the Transportation Committee, so I, you have a lot of knowledge on it. Is there anything that you're most worried about when it comes to transportation? Yes. I, um, I think we can work our way through the safety issues. Mm -hmm. I think we can solve the slow zones. I think we can ultimately get these new cars. We then have to re uh, make it so that people come back to public transportation. Right now, I think there's a lot of people doing that comparison every morning, mm -hmm. you know, train versus, or train and bus versus driving. And uh, people, I think, are driving more, especially with the hybrid work weeks when they may be only driving in three days. They're saying, I'll drive in for three days because I've got the other two days we don't have to deal with the commute, so I'll drive in as bad as it may be. We've got to get people to get back on our public transportation systems, but we've got to make sure that they're good enough to draw them back and that they're affordable and reliable, predictable and safe. And we have a ways to go with that. A lot of people have drifted away from public transportation. I know COVID was also part of the problem a couple of years ago with ridership and you know it just completely plummeting because people weren't well, they didn't feel safe riding the T and they wanted to kind of be in their own safe bubble. So has that played a part in it even now? It has. We've seen, we saw ridership drop dramatically with COVID, commuter rail and then each one of our um, other um, subway lines. The numbers are starting to come back up, but they're not quite where they were pre-COVID. Mm -hmm. And same thing on the buses. And then in the buses we have a particularly acute problem of attracting bus drivers. We're short a few hundred bus drivers. They're offering incentives and bonuses, but it's very difficult to get bus drivers because of how their work is scheduled. And the other interesting thing is the MBTA drug tests mm -hmm. their drivers, and some of these other companies do not. And with the prevalence of marijuana, uh, marijuana becoming more common, marijuana use, um, some would-be drivers are opting to drive for companies that don't drug test. And I'm not saying they're out there driving while they're high, mm -hmm. but marijuana stays in the system. And so they may not pass a drug test for the MBTA um, where they're not tested working for a private company. Okay. Um, so I have one, you know, one last issue that I, 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 you talked about a little bit in terms of like the opioid and mental health stuff, but COVID-19, um, that has been a big topic, obviously, for a few years, and it is still hanging around. So what are your, what are your thoughts on that, and do you still have any concerns for COVID? I hope it's gone. <laughs> uh, we'll go away, because it's still here. Yeah. It's still here. We still, uh, I see the reports that come out weekly about the number of people dying. There's still hundreds of people a week dying. There's just an article in the Boston Globe that uh, revealed that who's dying has changed, mm -hmm. um, but it's still here. Yeah. And so I think, we have to recognize that. It may be that it becomes a situation more like the seasonal flu where people can make a decision about whether they should get a COVID booster or get a flu shot. They can make those types of decisions. 
Um, this winter was pretty good with it, okay. Mm -hmm. um, but it is a concern and it's, it's the concern about maybe the reemergence of COVID, but also the concern about what's next. And are our public health systems in good enough shape to handle another COVID pandemic with something perhaps worse? Mm -hmm. And so there's been legislation that's been filed to basically modernize our public health delivery system right down to the local level. And I think that's going to be really important so that if we're confronted with something like COVID again, we're better prepared that we're not wondering, do we do centralized vaccination sites or allow the municipalities to do it? Do the vaccines work? Whether they manufactured timely? Do we have enough masks? That all those things are in place in, in preparation for when the next one happens. And I assume there will be another one, hopefully not for a long, long time. Let's hope not. <laughs> but, you know, I, you know, whenever the last outbreak was 80 years ago, 100 years ago, yeah. people probably said, oh, it won't happen again. And the, the older I get, the more I realize time goes by quickly. And <laughs> 60, 70, 80 years is a snap of a finger. Yeah. Um, so we have to be prepared. So that's my biggest concern relative to COVID. Okay. All right. Well, Senator, is there anything else that you'd like to talk about? Um, I just, I guess I'd say that if anybody has any sort of a, an issue with state government, to please reach out to us. Mm -hmm. um, they can reach me at email john.keenan at masenate.gov or by calling the office at 617-722-1494. Mm -hmm. uh, somebody will pick up the phone, somebody will respond to the email. And if people have an issue with the registry of motor vehicle, getting food benefits, I have a concern about a traffic safety uh, issue on a state road, whatever it may be, uh, please call our office and we're happy to help. Um, I have a great team in place. I've been very fortunate um, in that respect. And also I've been very lucky. Um, the number of precincts that I represent in Braintree is fewer now because of redistricting, mm -hmm. but I work very closely well, uh, with Senator Walter Timbleton. We work very closely together in the Senate and we work very closely with Representative Cusack. Um, so if there's something that's happening, even you know maybe it's in my district, we work together, the three of us, on it. If somebody calls, we make sure everybody's kind of in the loop on it. And um, if somebody calls our offices and Senator Timothy's office, then we establish that connection and make sure that the issue is addressed regardless of where the person in Braintree lives. Okay. Uh, and that goes throughout the district as well. I'm very fortunate to work with a great group of representatives and senators. And again, I am so lucky in my office to have an incredible team. We had, I was just um, down in Holbrook at office hours and Doreen Bagu, who works in my office, was there. And a woman specifically came to office hours with flowers to thank Doreen for work that she had done. Oh, um, and um, so I just have a really good team. My t chief of staff, a communications legislative director, a legislative aide, just really a good, good group. Doug, Mark, Peter, and, and Bridget, just, and Doreen, great group. So if someone did want to come visit you guys, what are your office hours and where? Uh, as long as the state house is open, generally they have, but um, generally nine to five, the state house is open and Doug, um, is there every day with somebody, two or three, four people in the office every day. Uh, we were in room 413B, which is on the fourth floor of the Bowdoin side of the building, Bowdoin Street side of the building. Uh, people go in through the main entrance now, the hooker entrance, and um, they can come up to the office. And also, if people can't make it to the State House for a meeting, I'm happy to meet people at the local library um, if to discuss an issue at a local coffee shop, whatever it may be, in addition to our regularly scheduled office hours. Um, happy to meet people anywhere. And I do that quite a bit. Just the other day, I was at the Thomas Crane Library in Quincy with a couple constituents. Oh, nice. um, so it's um, happy to do that. It works for them, so it works for us. Awesome, great. Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure to talk with you, Senator. Well, thank you, Martha. Thanks for having me. Yeah, of course. I've been talking with Senator John Keenan. Senator, thank you so much again. I'm Martha Constantinides, and thank you for watching Community Connection. See you next time.